Hello and welcome to Monday's Grenade Reports, live with the latest across the Northwest. Hello, thanks for joining us on the programme this evening. Three weeks, three young people stabbed to death. We ask a campaigner how many more have to die before we recognise knife crime as a crisis. Check your children. Check your children. I'm a mum with a teenager, making sure they're aware of you know, the friends that they hang around with, what the friends are up to. The devastation, pictures of the damage after fire rips through Thornton Manor, one of our region's most popular wedding venues. Sitting at a piano but laid low by coronavirus, concern of the numbers of children on the Isle of Man hit by long COVID. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Nothing. It hits our screens tonight. Don't miss the BAFTA-winning writer behind ITV's latest drama, No Return, and many more of our favourite shows. And it was frosty last night. Temperatures will not be falling as low tonight. All the weather details are coming up later on in the programme. But first tonight, three weeks, three young people stabbed to death in Greater Manchester. The police say that they're now increasing their use of stop and search powers to try to reduce the number of knives, but is it enough? Tonight we're asking a campaigner who works to educate young people about the dangers of knife crime if we as a society are doing enough. The latest stabbing claimed the life of a 20-year-old man in Tameside. Our correspondent Elaine Wilcox reports from the scene. There has been intense forensic activity at a terraced house in Duckenfield close to the latest fatal stabbing. 20-year-old Dylan Keelan was attacked outside a local shop on Friday night. It's believed he'd gone to buy balloons for a party. Local people desperately tried to resuscitate him, but he couldn't be saved. Knife crime is soaring in Greater Manchester, where the rest of the country has seen it fall. Police say often minor disputes turn fatal when knives are involved. If those individuals hadn't carried a knife, then maybe Dylan would still be here now. And whoever did this have no doubt ruined their own life and that of their mother, their father, their siblings. You know, and again, it all comes down to one thing. If the knife wasn't present, when these disputes happen, for whatever reason, and often they're incredibly low-level disputes, we would avoid these tragedies. Dylan's mum said he was a kind, respectful boy and his death has left her broken. And they want to know why he was targeted. The death of Dylan Keelan is the third fatal stabbing in Greater Manchester over the past three weekends. Despite knife amnesties and numerous initiatives by Greater Manchester Police urging people not to carry knives, the message clearly still isn't getting through. 16-year-old Kenny Carter was stabbed to death close to his home in Stretford on January the 22nd. Nine people, some as young as 14, have been arrested for his murder. The following weekend, 17-year-old Alan Zelogowski died from a single stab wound in Close Park in Salford. Overnight, police say another 21-year-old suffered serious injuries after he was stabbed in Walkden. Police have now been given extra powers to stop and search people in hotspots across Greater Manchester, warning young people carrying knives will be arrested. It's never too late to change a life. I've did it. Matthew Norford was a former gang member from Manchester who's joined forces with youth workers, urging people to ditch the knives. If you know one of your friends is getting in something that's, that's not good, that could lead to something bad, tell your friends. And speaking as a father, if I thought my child was in a position that they might carry a knife for one reason or another, I wouldn't hesitate to search the bedroom and search them. A young person's been stabbed every weekend for the past 12 months in Greater Manchester. The police say they can't tackle the epidemic in knife crime alone and need help and a change in attitudes to stop more senseless deaths. Elaine Wilcox, ITV News, Tameside. Yeah, those figures are so disturbing. Well, Laura Hughes became a knife crime campaigner after her brother Colin was stabbed to death 20 years ago. Yeah, Laura found out earlier today that her work to prevent knife crime has won her a Spirit of the London Marathon Award. Her campaign, No Knife Crime, has helped distribute anti-bleed kits and training across the Northwest. It's also helped educate young people in school. Yeah, we asked Laura what can be done to help stop this cycle of violence. I think prevention is the key. 
I think that all agencies need to work collaboratively on a much bigger scale. I think that there are a lot of people doing a lot of amazing things from an anti-knife crime perspective. We just need more manpower, basically, more, more people engaged and prevention work is key across all communities, across all schools, as young as primary school age, really. I mean, Greater Manchester Police are talking about using stop and search powers now. Do you think that will be a solution? I think it is, and it will impact the nighttime economy and obviously um, young kids who are out, out and about with their friends. But I think at that point, at the stop and search point, there's already intent to cause harm. There's already that thought process of taking a knife out. I think the problem's far greater than that. And I think we actually need to really strip it back and work with kids in advance of them even thinking about going down that route of taking a knife out. The government, I think it's fair to say, is a bit preoccupied at the moment with the pandemic and other issues. Is enough attention being paid to knife crime at the moment? I don't think so. I don't think there is. I think with what's happened over the last few years, COVID has obviously dominated what's um, going on from a news perspective, and, and rightly so, but that's, uh, we've also got a, an epidemic of what's happening from a knife crime perspective that's affecting every city across the country, and it's not necessarily um, discriminating from a social demographic either. As someone who has been so terribly affected by knife crime, by losing your brother, can you believe that we're still having these conversations over and over again? Not really. Um, it's very sad. I think stuff that's happened across the northwest, well, across the country, but definitely um, cases I've been amazed, aware of that have happened across the northwest since before Christmas are just shocking, absolutely shocking, unavoidable completely and utterly avoidable. What would you say to a parent watching tonight who maybe has suspicions that their kids are going out with knives? Check your children. Check your children. I'm a mum with a teenager and with a younger son, and I, would, I, I will always have open conversations with my children about it, obviously because I've been affected by it, but I'm conscious of, uh, you know, keeping them in check, but also making them aware of um, guilty by association, making sure they're aware of, you know, the friends that they're hanging around with, what the friends are up to, and just by being placed in a situation can put their lives in, you know, considerable danger. Laura Hughes, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, next up tonight, it's one of our region's most popular places for big family events like weddings and christenings and a popular venue for conferences. But tonight, the owners of the Thornton Manor Hotel, a grade two listed mansion in Wirral, are counting the cost of the massive fire there. Yeah, fire crews have been at the scene since the fire broke out on Saturday night. Guests at a wedding had to be led to safety. Let's cross live now to our reporter, Victoria Grimes, at the scene for us. Vicky, what's the latest? Well, Lucy, an absolutely devastating fire for, for all concerned, really. And the latest tonight, we have heard, though, that Merseyside Police say that it's not being treated as suspicious. An investigation is underway. Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service are dealing with that um, and what they've described as a prolonged and extremely challenging incident. Now, they were called here on Saturday at around about nine o'clock to reports of it's sort of a, a boiler room fire. Uh, that was extinguished before they arrived, but then it spread to the room area. Now there was a wedding going on as you say at the time and some of the guests have talked about how they were dancing away just enjoying the evening on the dance floor when they were told that they had to get out uh, as quickly as possible and, and were evacuated. And I think it's thanks to the, the quick thinking of, of the staff that um, you know that, that nobody was hurt here and when you look at the pictures of the damage that's been caused which I think you can probably see now um, it, it's really quite incredible that nobody was injured. Um, fire crews are still here this evening. They've been here continuously since Saturday evening, working relentlessly, they've said, to make sure the fire is completely extinguished. Um, we're surrounded now at the moment. There's still pumps um, and, and other equipment here as well. And they really um, say that it's, it's been a very challenging incident to deal with. Now, they... Um, 
say that it's, it, it's going to be a little while before they can leave the immediate vicinity. It's an old building. It's historic, built in the 19th century, so difficult um, for them to uh, deal with it. It's a complex fire. Uh, and Vicky, what about those due to get married? What more do we know those... about them? Yeah, well, I've spoken to people today, some due to get married here at the weekend, and obviously they've got a real struggle now to try and find alternative arrangements. Some say they've been offered alternative venues. Thornton Manor tonight say that uh, they are trying to get in touch with all of their brides and grooms. They've thanked people for their patience, but said they can't comment on what is an ongoing investigation. OK, Vicky, thank you. In other news, a teenager from Greater Manchester has admitted killing his 15-year-old sister at a holiday park in North Wales. 19-year-old Matthew Selby from Ashton Underline pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of his sister Amanda. Amanda died after police were called to reports of a domestic disturbance in Tawin last summer. Selby will be seen by a psychiatrist before his sentencing next month. Arrow Park Hospital in Merseyside is now one step closer to a major upgrade. The Wirral Hospital wants to spend £28 million on a new urgent and emergency care facility. Demolition work necessary to make way for the new units can now go ahead. If given the green lights, the work could be completed in two years. OK, lots to work on the programme coming up. The decision is to take the, both teams off the field. Police investigate alleged racist abuse during the Northwest Derby between Morecambe and Bolton. That's coming up in sport. And after a rather wet and windy weekend for many of us, hopefully there'll be a little bit more of this to come as we get towards the end of the week. Join me later for a full forecast. Great picture there, thanks, Joe. Children in the Isle of Man are helping to plant 70 trees to mark the Queen's 70 years on the throne. It's all part of the Queen's Green Canopy Initiative to plant a tree for the Jubilee. I love that ring. Plant a tree <laughs> for the Jubilee. Uh, the trees have been chosen to match those in the grounds of Buckingham Palace. They have been planted next to a new cycleway at Spring Valley along the edge of Douglas Golf Course. Yeah, they'll always remember that. Well, staying on the Isle of Man and the Manx government is concerned at the number of people affected by long COVID, still feeling the effects of the virus many months later. Yes, thought more than 500 people on the island have the symptoms. Our Manx reporter, Joshua Stokes, has spoken to one mother whose nine-year-old daughter is still struggling almost a year on. Nine-year-old Gabby has felt the full force of COVID. She tested positive in March last year. Ten months on, and she's still feeling the effects. She constantly had the chest pains. The GP at the time was very helpful and very, very worried about Gabby. Um, she couldn't see anything that would be particularly wrong. But that night, unfortunately, Gabby collapsed. She was still conscious, but she couldn't use her legs. How did you feel when all these things were happening to you? What was, what was it like for you? Where's the thumbs down? Were you scared? Yes. Even though when I started trying running, five seconds in, I already felt breathless. Mm. Since then, the family have been struggling to share Gabby's story. A comment that Gabby made to me recently, which is stuck out, why doesn't anybody believe me? And that's a very strong statement from a nine-year-old to say, because with long COVID, most of it isn't visible. The Manx government predicts over 500 people have been living with long COVID for over a year. Symptoms range from major fatigue to more serious conditions with the heart and lungs, and these can vary based on age. Children seem to have a much lower risk of the organ-based long-term side effects. So the symptoms there are more likely to be around the fatigue, the loss of concentration, loss of energy. Infection has only been with us for two years, so actually understanding how that plays out long term is far from complete. And the worry amongst some is the effect it can have on education. The advice from the government is for schools to adapt. Obviously raise any concerns with the head teachers and they'll be able to make adjustments for the students um, with regards to timetables, what continuing education they can do if they're not in school and obviously possibility that they could do so some work at home. I mean we're 10 months into this now and it's still continuing like every day. There's always something every day. 
And for a parent, it's hard to watch your child sit there and cry because we don't know what's going on and it, it's quite frightening. Fears that will be shared by many across the Northwest who, like Gabby, are facing more unanswered questions. Joshua Stokes, ITV News, in the Isle of Man. OK, um, here's what's still to come on the ITV News at 6.30 with Mary. Coming up on the programme, why has a plan to tackle England's huge NHS backlog been delayed? The Prime Minister has denied it stands for rift with the Chancellor and promises he will tackle waiting lists. Also ahead, exam help for the class of 2022. We'll have the details. Can neighbours be saved after Channel 5 dumped the classic soap? Don't wait for that and more at 6.30. Um, next, if you think of some of the best TV dramas in recent years, I'm thinking Clocking Off, Shameless, Safe, The Stranger, they've all got something in common. Yeah, they're all fab. They've also got something else in common, though, and this is someone who doesn't get a starring role, but he is absolutely vital. He's the man who wrote them. Danny Brocklehurst from Hyde. Well, the good news is he's created another new drama which we can see on our screens for the first time this evening. It's called No Return, it's on ITV and it stars the incredible Sheridan Smith. Our entertainment correspondent, Caroline Whitmore, caught up with Danny ahead of his new show, Going On Air. Danny Brocklehurst, I have wanted to interview you for years. Your name comes up time and time again on all the dramas that I love. Police, they need to talk to your son. My son? No return starts this evening on ITV. No return is about a very ordinary family, Sheridan Smith being the, the, the mum, Kathy, and they go on a two week holiday to uh, Turkey and Kathy's son Noah gets arrested on an allegation of sexual assault and he gets um, dragged into the Turkish legal system. He denies the allegation. The lawyer character at one point says, you're no longer on holiday, you're in hell. You're no longer on holiday, this is hell. I'm a writer who likes to write and relate to the situations. You're from Hyde originally. Yeah. You, you've got an office in Manchester. Some of the sets and the scenes were, were filmed around Manchester. Mm. Is that important to you to try and give your dramas a bit of a Northwest feel? Yeah, always. Everything I do is set in Manchester or in the Northwest until somebody tells me different. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's basically, I mean, obviously this one's set predominantly in Turkey, but, you know, the family are from Manchester. People these days, they're wanting the next episode immediately. Do you feel the pressure of that? The way we watch things has changed dramatically. And no, it turns the same. It goes out over four weeks, but you can watch it on ITV Hub all at once if you, you know, if you so choose. But I do think sometimes it sort of seems indecently quick. Like, you know, you've worked on something for 18 months and then people go, yeah, I watched it all in a day. And you're like, that's, what that's I mean. just taken me, you know, a year and a half to yeah. make. I mean, we've done, you know, we've done uh, three of the Harlan thrillers now for Netflix, Safe, uh, The Stranger and Stay Close. And, you know, they've just sort of talked about the figures for Stay Close worldwide. And they are, I mean, they are bigger than any show I've ever done anywhere. I mean, you're talking like tens of tens and tens and tens of millions of viewers, you know, I mean, massive figures. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. Do you remember our life in here? You said you worked with Sheridan Smith before. Was that on the film The Railway Children Return? Yes. Sheridan is in The Railway Children Return, which comes out in summer in a nerve-wracking sequel to the, uh, to the original. It's not really a sequel, actually, and it's about trains and it's set in the same village. <laughs> And Jenny Agat is in it, but other than that, it's nothing to do with the original. It's not enough. You don't even know how much is there. How much is there? Loads. Sick. Nailed it. Do you have a standout favourite of the dramas that you've written? Listen, it's always hard to choose. Very pleased with Brassic, just because I, you know, it, the audience response to it has been phenomenal. Would you ever do cameos in your own dramas, or are you <laughs> like, no, Cal, I'm not doing that? Some years ago, in Shameless, I had to walk, and I think I did that quite badly. And all I had to do was <laughs> all I had to do was walk. Well, nobody's that interested in writers, thankfully, you know. So it's. <laughs> and I talked before about how people are impatient, and I think the first thing I said to you was, "How does no return end?" <laughs> I don't want to tell you because I want you to watch it. <laughs> Brilliant. You tell the truth and you tell it hard. Oh, that looks like a great watch, doesn't it? See, like, I, I know people are binge watching films but I, and, and programmes, but I do like the idea of waiting a week. You know, you can build your evening around it, can't you? Yeah, but you can make yourself wait a week. Yeah. Just don't go on 
Good to watch her. It's got to be a bit disciplined, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe's got the weather. <laughs> Now that is brew weather. And only boiling what she needs. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Big up you, sis. Thank you. A very good evening to you. A rather cloudy, damp start to the working week for many places and breezy as well. Another windy day to come tomorrow. Lots of cloud around, some spells of rain. And then a little bit colder as we go through the middle part of the week, returning to unsettled, wet and windy weather for this weekend. Mild and cold air vying for dominance over the next few days. It stays mild until probably Wednesday evening into Thursday. Then the colder air digs in and high pressure begins to establish itself fairly briefly. So fine and settled for Thursday night and Friday before wet and windy weather resumes into this weekend. Now this evening and overnight, a few breaks in the cloud, also one or two outbreaks of drizzle here and there, ahead of some rain that will be moving into the Isle of Man, Cumbria and North Lancashire by dawn. But for the rest of us, a dry night and free from frost, quite breezy as well before tomorrow morning. Seven or eight Celsius, the overnight low. On to tomorrow. First of all, the sun will be up at 7.45, setting at six minutes past five tomorrow evening. Tomorrow then, quite a cloudy start for most places. A spell of heavy rain across northern counties to start tomorrow morning. Dry for the rest of us, but breezy and rather cloudy. We'll see a few glimmers of brightness, Cheshire, Derbyshire way, but a fairly cloudy and windy day in prospect with patchy rain and drizzle, certainly from Greater Manchester northwards tomorrow afternoon. Temperature-wise, still on the mild side, 11 or 12 Celsius, but pretty windy, so not feeling warm as such. And then over the next couple of days, we'll see temperatures taking a bit of a knock. It becomes chillier, but drying out Thursday afternoon into Friday. That high pressure takes control. Cold, but fine. Bye-bye. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Two sugars, please. Oh, lovely. Cold, but fine. I can definitely live with that. Yeah, hot water bottles at the ready. That's it from us, good luck. Bye-bye.